Greetings. Welcome to another Truth Factor discussion. My name is John Duvall, and we have a host of intelligent men waiting behind the door to come in and join us for the study today, but we're telling them no. We're going to let our normal group participate in this study. <laughs> All right, it was funnier in my head than what it actually sounded like when I said it. And uh, <laughs> matter of fact, let me, let me introduce you to everyone here. There we go. So up over in the left-hand corner there, you've got Brian, where the mouse is. All right, and then skip the middle hodgepodge, and you've got Paul. And notice the similarity between Brian and Paul. They both have glasses. They both have similar hairlines uh, on top of their heads. And then down here below Paul, we have Mr. Mike. And then to the left of Mike, we have Tom. And that's about the best I can do with Zoom multi-view mode. Anyway... So what we're doing is we're in our study of Romans and we're currently um, We'll be studying Romans chapter 6 here in just a couple of minutes. It is a very interesting chapter uh, The Apostle Paul having made the point that we're all justified by faith um, In Jesus Christ, but the justification of course comes from God It is not of ourselves and he explained the whole point of how sin came into the world and how salvation came into the world as well We hit Romans chapter 6 the Apostle Paul is going to paint the picture of what it is like after an individual becomes dead to sin, but alive in Christ. And there are some, some things that he points out there. They seem pretty obvious, but oftentimes we kind of get caught up in the ways of the world and, and we forget that what we're doing is completely contrary to our servitude to God. And so Paul helps us to keep our eyes focused on that. In just a couple of minutes, though, we'll turn it over to Brian, who will be leading the study today. But before we do that, I want to ask Paul, if you would, to let everyone know how they can participate in today's study. If you'd like to participate with us today, you might consider looking at any of the social media like YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. And you'd look for Facebook, not Facebook, you look for Truth Factor Live. And if you do that, uh, you'll be able to find us very easily. If you make a comment in Facebook, in fact, we can bring that into our um, study today to introduce your thought. Also on the YouTube, if you're using YouTube and finding Truth Factor Live, it would be great for you to uh, use their chat because that's very easy for us to bring your comment, your question, your answer into our study today. We love interaction with those who are out there. You might also remember that we would like for you to, if possible, subscribe uh, and click for notifications. And so we, I know on YouTube, that's the little bell uh, for the notifications after you've subscribed. And that's helpful to us. And it also notifies you whenever we go live. John? Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. All right, let me bring up to the forefront Mr. Brian Haynes from Portland, Oregon. Brian will be leading our study today of Romans chapter 6. How you doing, Brian? I'm doing really good today and uh, excited to get there. And here in just a moment, we'll uh, uh, have some uh, reading going out there. I'm going to have Tom read for us Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. As a reminder, in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul was explaining the great grace of God, that Jesus would come and while we were yet sinners, die for us. And that by this great gift, uh, grace was imparted that those who were followers of Adam, meaning those who had chosen to sin, uh, might by becoming followers of Jesus uh, receive the grace of God and an inheritance, eternal life, the things that we uh, greatly desire to know. But Paul's going to uh, uh, make a, a point here as we begin in chapter 6 now that, that might be something that somebody misunderstood about chapter 5. And so uh, we'll begin by reading verses 1 through 9 of Romans chapter 6. And I'm going to ask Tom if he would uh, to read that for us. Tom, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, I am. All right. Okay, so we read here in uh, uh, New King James Version. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we had been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly 
also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Thank you very much, Tom. So we're throwing a chat question out, and um, uh, I hope the chat question makes sense, and uh, let me read it to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, we read that the gospel is described as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So how does Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 explain how we obey the gospel, uh, which is a term that's used in several places, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. So I'd like some uh, thought on that, if you would. What, uh, what would be the idea of obeying the gospel if the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus uh, that Romans 6 is so important to understand? So appreciate your thoughts on that, and uh, we'll move on on our part and come back to this question momentarily. <clears throat> So I think I'm going to jump over to John here for a second. John, um, I've always kind of wondered when Paul starts off by saying in verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Why would somebody see that as a, as a potential conclusion to what he had said before? Why would somebody say that uh, we should sin so that grace might abound? What might their thinking be? Well, especially when you stop and think about a lot of the argumentation regarding why Christ died. And the grace of God making that death possible and the purpose for that death, it really sounds like I've got this big old basket full um, of, of motor oil, and over here is a big old bottle of gain. This bottle of gain will wash all that oil away very easily. So I can play in the oil all I want. As long as I've got this gain, I'll always cleanse myself. It's almost like, you know, the more. You know, if God's going to show me grace because of my sin, then, hey, the more I sin, the more grace of God I get. What's wrong with that? That's a, that's a great a analogy. What would you say is a, a doctrine today that men teach that uh, um, that would that would uh, expect that? Well, part of the what what's normally called the Calvinist doctrine or, or the tulip doctrine, the way it's, it's laid out there, is I believe the terminology is perseverance of the saints. Um, great. And in that concept, and, and, and part part of it kind of goes in with first, they pull in first John chapter one, the latter part of five through 10. And, and it is the idea there that we can never lose our souls. We can never be lost as far as God is concerned. The grace of God will always cover us. Um, someone years ago used the analogy of like an umbrella, you know, and um, so, um, the, the idea that, that we can never be lost because the grace of God always washes away our sins once we are initially saved. It's kind of, you know, we got to start from that point. We've got to be saved first. Then the grace of God always covers all of our sins. Even if we haven't committed them yet, we will, and he will cover. It, they don't, don't even talk about repentance. Yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, Tom, you got a thought? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, j just kind of uh, uh, not stepping on John, but uh, a clarification, if you will. Uh, 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 I don't think virtually anybody in the denominational world actually rationalizes I should sin more so that I can have more of the grace of God, at least. That's true. But the point, but the point that John made, that doctrine lends to that. Yeah. The doctrine of once saved, always saved perseverance of the saints it very much lends to the concept of it doesn't matter i might as well keep on sinning because the grace of god's going to cover it so yeah but you know what's and and i agree with what you're saying tom and i that as officially from the pulpits they don't teach that but man you look at the behavior and not just denominations yeah. but you look at the behavior of many christians and many gospel preachers it makes you wonder if they do believe that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. And it's a necessary, it's a necessary, it's a necessary conclusion of teaching once saved, always saved. I mean, yeah. when 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 you teach that the impossibility of losing your salvation, why change unless just because you want to? Of course, that's what they emphasize. If you love God, you're going to change anyways. And and then they've got the fallback. If you don't change, then you really didn't love God in the first place. Therefore, you never were saved. And, 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 but, but that's a cop-out. No offense. 
That, that's a great that's a great uh, observation, Tom. Uh, and it really is. You're right. Uh, these are the these are some of the great problems of Calvinism. Um, and it's kind of interesting, Paul, uh, that uh, Paul here seems to be dealing with that very case that somebody who might try to make that case would make. Um, let's go to our Paul for a second. And Paul, um, when he talks about the idea that we die to sin, what what are some of the ways that uh, those who are in Christ have died to sin? What does that mean exactly? Well, think of the statement that I think you brought out to the uh, to the chat room, First Corinthians fifteen, that talks about the death, burial, and resurrection. I also thought about what Paul wrote uh, when he wrote to the uh, Galatians in chapter two and verse twenty, where he says, "I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me." And so, there's this transition that that is taking place, and so that we are wanting to get sin uh, entirely out of our lives. We know that in obedience to the gospel, we repent. At Pentecost, they were told to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts 3, it says, repent and be converted. Uh, and so we know that there has to be this change that takes place. Jesus even said, uh, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And so here we have this uh, repentance that's necessary. We have to turn away from sin. We have to change from just uh, living in it to just going through life, uh, not really concerned about it, to the fact that we're wanting to take it out of our lives. And he says, how uh, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so the Christian can't just say, well, uh, I'm a Christian now, but I'll, uh, it's okay for me to, to sin now and then. Uh, the Christian needs to have the attitude, I'm going to do everything I can uh, to turn away from that uh, and to turn to God in, in every way, in every aspect of my life. Uh, that's, a, that's a great answer. I appreciate the fact that you, you kind of pointed to it two directions, the sins that I died to in the past and the sin that is around me now that I am dead to as well. And, and that was exactly uh, what I was uh, hoping we might get to, too. Uh, Tom, I'm going to throw a question at you, but Tom, I'm going to be honest, I don't know the answer to this question. And uh, that means you get the excuse of saying, if you don't either, um, we're, we're both going to be on the same page. Tom, I've always wondered about the language that it always speaks in the Bible that it's always specific to state that God raised Jesus from the grave. It, does, it never says that Jesus raised himself. Do you think there's significance to that? What would you say? Uh, actually, I do. Yeah? I think the significance is the fact that when Jesus died, it was an act of faith. And, 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 and so I, I think that's the point. God no, raised I've him never from thought the dead. Of that. Yeah, and, and just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so Jesus and God can raise and will raise us from the dead. So. I never thought of it that way, Tom. That's fantastic. Mike, have you got a thought that you want to throw? Or uh, well, I, I agree heartily with Tom's statement. Had God not raised Christ from the dead, there'd have been no proof conclusively that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Every, or that he was dead. Well, every individual that had been raised from the dead had been raised through the agency of some man, even under the Old Testament. Prophets raised the dead. Obviously, God did it, but did it through the prophets. In the New Testament, Jesus raised the dead. There wasn't any human, though, involved in the resurrection of Christ. That's why Acts 17, 31 says, He's given assurance unto all men everywhere, in that he, God, hath raised him, Christ, from the dead. I agree that it was an act of faith. But by the same token, had God the Father not done that, then there would have been no proof that he was the Son of God. No man of earth would have raised him. No man could have. Guys, these are these are great answers. I, uh, you really have, you've both kind of opened my uh, understanding a little more, and I appreciate that. Uh, those are really good thoughts about something I've kind of wondered about many times, and and uh, you've both given me something really great to think about. Uh, so, Mike... Yeah. Uh, Oh, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, and going along, the, I, I think I kind of interrupted Mike. But, but I mean, just, just add to that the fact that if Jesus raised himself, that would lend to the argument, did he really die? So, I mean, I mean and, and, and that builds on the point that Mike is making there. Uh, somebody had to raise him, just like every other person that was raised by Jesus, and even going back to the old time, was raised by somebody. So, so that's a point. Uh, that's just a really a, a great, some great answers, guys. Uh, um, I'm going to jump over to Mike for a second. I'm going to say, Mike, uh, the question I have from verse seven, it says, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So he's speaking of us being freed from sin. Yet he's going to go on, especially in chapter eight, to talk about, you know, the sinful flesh, that, that our flesh has a desire to sin. 
So if if we still have the desire to sin in the flesh, how is it that we're freed from sin? Our souls have been freed from it. We need to make our minds follow that soul redemption. I like Colossians 3 and verses 1 through 4 as an explanation of this. There Paul said, if you then be risen with Christ. Well, the only way to do that is baptism. And we've discussed that uh, down through verse 6. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right, side, or right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Now notice how he says it. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Then the next verse. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. How dedicated are we to serving Christ? And Paul will deal with that as we go on through the chapter in being freed from servant of sin to becoming now faithful servants to Christ. It's kind of a play on the word slave as we go through this chapter, but that's the idea of it. We, ju we do not any longer allow sin to reign and rule our mortal body. Christ now lives and reigns within us. That's a great answer. You know, I, I want to tell our audience a second that the rest of us uh, are able to look at the questions a few minutes ahead and prepare our answer. Mike has to do it completely off the cuff. So I want you all to be very impressed that Mike is able to bring <laughs> such knowledge to, to bring a, a, an answer so, so readily and so well. John, did you have any thoughts to add to either of the last two points? Well, I did, Brian. I'll, I'll take the most recent one first, and then I'll throw in the other one. Um, if Jesus had not died upon the cross of Calvary, it still would be possible for me to clean up my life, okay? I could stop swearing, stop lying, stop stealing, stop cheating on my wife. I could stop all those things of my own will and determination, but I would not be saved. And there would be no drive for me to walk away from those things because I'm forever lost. You, you think about that. When he died, he, he not only made it possible for us to be forgiven of our sins, but now we have the motivation to defeat our sins. You know, without his death, there, there's not even the motivation to defeat him, although we could attempt to do that, but it wouldn't save our souls. But since he paid the price for us, and hence the idea of the servitude, we're now being bought back. We're now servants of Christ, and we'll talk about all that later, of course. Um, may being made free from sin, I think it's much more than simply saying we've been forgiven, which is a lot of it. But we now have the motivation to move on past it and, and to, to throw off the shackles of it. And I think Mike was mentioning that as well. Um, I never thought of that, John. That's actually a really good point. Um, well, thank you. I wasn't um, thinking of that at all, but that really actually is a very, uh, a very astute observation. Thank you. Well, thank you. The, the, other, the other one goes back to what you were commenting about God raising Jesus from the dead. Let's not forget what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, that in order for an individual to be saved, we must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. I mean, there was a huge debate about, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, you know, over all the, the deity stuff of, of Christ and all that. But when we come down to it, what do, what do I have to believe to be saved? I got to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And, and just as Paul you know, and, and there's a whole there's a whole theological reason for that that we could get into, but it's, it's the concept is simple. This is what we have to believe. That's a that's a great, a really good point. Brian, um, I interject something right oh, yeah, here, please. Notice that when we ride to walk in newness of life, it is not by our own power any more than Jesus coming from the grave was by His own power. Paul says very plainly. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. This is verse four that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Yeah. We're raised in baptism and new life, just as God raised Christ to life after death. That's a, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic observation. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out just kind of a general generic question off of verse nine. In verse nine, we read that uh, Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. New King James Version there. Well, how how uh, was that the case, or what changed about Christ that death would have no dominion over him anymore? What do you guys think that the point there is? 
just throw it out. I'd like to borrow that question if I could, Brian. Yeah, please, it's yours. The word resurrection is an interesting word. There have been commentaries, dozens of them written, even by some of our brethren, who say, for example, that Dorcas was resurrected, Lazarus was resurrected, the son of the widow of Nain, resurrected, Jairus's daughter, resurrected. I will argue that they are not resurrected. They were raised from the dead. But the word resurrection means risen, not to die again. So that when Christ was raised from the dead, his earthly body would not die again. Just as just as uh, Enoch and Elijah didn't suffer death and their bodies were disposed of in some way that God took care of, same with Jesus. I don't know what happened to his body, but I know it did not die again. Well, the idea spiritually here is that we've put the old man of sin to death. We've crucified him. Galatians 2.20, as was pointed out a little while ago. No one lives through a crucifixion. So if that body of sin is destroyed and the soul raised to walk in newness of life, that's having part in, quote, the first resurrection from the book of Revelation. Are they that have part in the first resurrection? That's baptism. On them, the second death hath no power, said the Spirit to John. So being baptized, rising to walk in newness of life, commits us to a life of righteousness in Christ. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic answer. Actually, and Mike, that was the answer I wanted us to understand was the concept around the idea of, of and I like what you said, Mike, that the idea of resurrection is specific in the scriptures to refer to the idea of the raising and transformation spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, it's important to understand uh, specifically the idea is that to be raised, as you would have put it, Lazarus died again, uh, Tabitha died again. These are all people who have, have uh, passed from this life. So they were raised up from the dead only to die again. But the transformation, as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, implies the idea of a transformation to a body that no longer has death. Tom kind the of even referred to 1 John chapter 3. Immortal, immortal. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the corruptible and incorruptible. You're right. Yes. And uh, Tom made a reference in our private chat to 1 John 3, which was actually another passage I was thinking of where it says, we don't know what it will be like, but we know we'll be like him. And I think that that really does uh, have a reference here to the characteristics of the transformation and resurrection um, that, that we're supposed to believe in. The Hebrews chapter 6 it tells us it's one of the fundamentals of faith. So, mm -hmm. Brian, quick question. Your question had to pertain to death no longer has dominion over him? Yeah. All right. Now that, oh, hmm. and we need to consider that that is also talking about the physical death. Right, right. That's what I think he, I, I think he's saying that the transformation yeah. of his body meant that death was no longer something yeah. that could have power over him. So that, so that the natural physical body, because it's corrupting, because it's dying, Paul would say elsewhere it's dying, that yeah. it's the, the characteristic of physical death has no, uh, has a power over even Jesus, although Jesus never sinned, while right. he was a physical man, that death had that power. When he was raised and transformed, he was, uh, death no longer had that power. Okay. That's what I thought y'all were saying. I just wanted to joke. And Mike went really deep with his answers, really good. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I had to swim I, up and take a breath real quick. <laughs> yeah. And, and just one other quick thought just before we, uh, uh, just before we started the study of Romans, we, we did a short study on evidences and we talked about the resurrection. And I think one of the points that was made is that when Jesus was raised, he was different. I think that's evident by the appearances that uh, people had to take a second look. Right. But it was he was clearly it was clearly his body. And, 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 and that's the point to emphasize is in all of that. So so there was something different about him, which is why he wasn't going to die. Anymore. Right. You know, and, and Tom or uh, Tom, what's important about that is there are some today that don't believe, even among brethren that don't believe in a resurrection. They believe that oh, yeah. there is no resurrection coming or a day of resurrection or a day of judgment. Um, and that's, you know, the Bible, of course, talks about the shipwreck of faith that comes by those that deny the resurrection. Yeah. Um, 
So I guess it's time for us to go back to our chat question. It looks like we got a couple of answers. We got one in uh, uh, one on our Facebook chat and one on our YouTube chat. So which one do we want to bring up first there, John? Since you're driving, I'll let you pick one and then I'll throw we'll go, up. We'll go to Facebook first. It was the first one that popped up in my feed. Okay. And that was an answer given by Dan Gatlin, who's uh, been a guest here too. And uh, Dan uh, tells us that the answer is baptism represents the death, burial, of, uh, death and burial of the old man, and the rising to walk in the newness of life. And uh, that's exactly right, Dan. Uh, 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 that was what we're looking at here. Um, Gregor gives us a little, uh, a little more thought uh, to a different direction in a sense. He says the gospel being our path to righteousness, if we do not have the faith to follow his path. How can we partake in those bless in those blessings? If we don't die to sin, we can't be raised in purity. Uh, so Gregor really gave us a sense too of the idea of following Christ, uh, you know, <clears throat> in in baptism too. So uh, we get a sense of that as well. So I'm really appreciative of those comments, guys. Thank you so much uh, to our chat for giving us that. Now we're going to go on in Romans chapter six, and we're going to read verses ten through fourteen. And I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask Paul if he would to read for us Romans chapter six verses ten through 14 be happy to do that the scripture there says for the death that he died he died to sin once for all but the life that he lives he lives to god likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to god in christ jesus our lord therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it, it in its lusts and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So we're going to throw a chat question out there. and Hopefully it's not too complicated of a question. Um, so he mentions there in verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So the question is, how could we let sin reign? Uh, how can we let sin reign in our mortal body? How is, uh, what, what would that mean when he warns us about that? So if our chat can give us some thoughts on that, we'd appreciate it. Um, let me jump over to John and ask him a couple of questions here. Um, John, the language here he talks about is being dead to sin in Christ. And I'm wondering what exactly that means. And, and what I mean is, how does that manifest itself? How does it make itself, uh, how do I understand the idea of sin being dead? Does that mean I'll never sin again once I become a Christian? Does does all of my desire to sin now leave if I've become a Christian? Um, and, and I might suggest maybe some people say that. John, what do you think about that? Well, I wish you'd give me a, an easier question. <laughs> no, actually, I do, I do think that the concept of the answer here is on on a, on a kind of a simple level, but at the same time, the application of that um, says a lot about our hearts when an individual is converted to Christ. Uh, the concept of being converted to Christ, being converted to the gospel, is a complete change of mind, and therefore, even we put to death the old man of sin. We're putting to death, you know, what we used to formerly desire. We no longer we have the control over, and we no longer let those des those uh, desires control us. So when he says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. Formerly, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 makes that very plain to us. All right, now that we were dead, we have been made alive. You know, you were talking about the resurrection a while ago, and I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, there, We are waiting for the resurrection to come, but there has, in a sense, been a resurrection to already have taken place. You know, our old body... Our old man of sin, we, we have now put that old man of sin to death, and we have made the decision there to be alive, not to be alive. But knowing that we are now alive in Jesus Christ, we now choose to walk in our servitude to God. So um, I, I hate to use this analogy because I think it can be overused, but it's like a parent saying to the child, you're dead to me because the child has chosen a very you know life that he should not walk. Well, we should look to sin and say, you're dead to me. I'm now alive in God, and whatever desires I have before, no matter how strongly they may appeal to me, my servitude to God should cause me to view that I'm dead to that sin. That's a great answer. Actually, I think your analogy uh, is, is an important one that, 
that really does give us a sense of what we're saying here. You mentioned that this isn't the only resurrection. Revelation 20 mentions that there's a first resurrection and the second resurrection. He says those who have the first resurrection need not fear the second death. And uh, I've always thought that's a nice analogy contrasted with what we've read in Romans chapter 6. Paul, I'm going to jump over to you if I can. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, if we are under grace, does that mean we're not under law? Uh, verse 14 uh, seems to say that very thing. Somebody comes to you and says to you, Paul, well, you know, I don't worry about breaking the law anymore of Christ because I'm under grace and I'm not under law. Paul, what would you say to somebody who said that? Well, there's a couple of different thoughts I had about this passage, and uh, I'll just throw them both out. We've already discussed uh, <clears throat> talking about Abraham and talking about he was righteous apart from the law. And there may be a, a reference here of continuing back from that previous discussion in talking about the law. You're not under the law, which was very uh, regimented, very uh, uh, rules and consequences, uh, but you're under this grace. Uh, that may be what Paul's think, talking about here, but I, th I think maybe a, a little deeper thought than that is that there is a transformation that takes place when one becomes a Christian. And uh, here he's talking about that not just walking uh, according to the lust of the flesh, not just walking uh, according to whatever the, the sinful passion would be there, whatever desire would be there, but instead you've been transformed to be something better that you could not have otherwise been. I think about what Paul wrote uh, to the Romans in Romans 12 and verse 1 and 2. He, he talks about two different concepts. He talks about uh, being conformed and not to be conformed to this world, not to be molded and shaped to this world. But instead, he says that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to be something that without God's power, we could not otherwise be. And I think that may be at the heart of what he's saying here, that we're not under the law. We're not under that law of sin and death he talks about, but we're under grace. We are participants, and we've been changed uh, because of who we are in Christ. That's a, that's a really good answer. Thank you, Paul. Uh, put a lot of good thought in that. Anybody else want to add anything? Because if not, let's jump over to Tom. And Tom, here's what I'm wondering about here. As we read through this, one of the things we talked about is that verse 14 says, sin doesn't have dominion over me. That word dominion is important. It's the idea of, a, of an authority or a power over me. And we're also going to see the wages of sin being death and some of the language there. Here's my question, Tom. If sin doesn't have dominion over me, why does death have dominion over me? Um, in other words, uh, even as it even spoke of Christ there, why is it that I can be free from sin, but not free from death? Uh, are you talking physical versus spiritual death? Ad? Well, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 obviously there's two different types of death. Uh, uh, physical death is the consequence of the, Adam, of the sin of Adam. So, uh, you know, and, and we've talked about that a little bit before. We don't inherit the sin of Adam, contrary to what many in the denominational and religious world teach. Catholicism teaches that. We inherit, but we do inherit the consequences of the sin of Adam. And one of those consequences is the fact that all men are going to die physically, materially. So uh, he's, he's obviously not, uh, you know, when, when he talks about that uh, or when we understand that, it doesn't mean we're not going to physically die. But if we're living the way that we ought to, we will not be hurt by the second death, something that you alluded to a few moments ago because, because we've been part of the first resurrection. And, and so I think that's what we're, we're dealing with here. Very good. Very good, Tom. Uh, you know, and it is important, like I said, that we see the word dominion used twice here, used back with verse 9 about death having a dominion over Christ until he arose from the grave, and then that dominion was taken away. Uh, so we rightly see, just uh, as you talked about here, we're not necessarily talking about the dominion of, of physical death, which is there till we're raised from the dead, but the second death is the one that we're, uh, Revelation 20 would point to us, that we're ready for. Um, if there's no other thoughts, let's go back to our chat question. I see we've got an answer in our Facebook. Oh, we have two answers. So uh, we have one in our Facebook and one in our YouTube. It looks like Dan Gatlin and Facebook got back to us first. So I'm going to grab him first if uh, we can grab that comment. Uh, Dan said uh, the question was, how can we let sin reign in our mortal body? And Dan Gatlin said, by sinning, by following our passions and desires without attempting to keep those under control.
daily self-discipline is essential to be saved. Dan, that could be a sermon, right? Daily self-discipline is essential to be saved. That's uh, uh, a, a profound and important idea. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, now let's jump over to Facebook, or I'm sorry, to YouTube. And in our YouTube chat, Gregor Hinckley, Gregor Hinckley gives us James 3, verses 14 and 15, which speaks about the uh, sensual as demonic, sensual being carnal or physical things, especially pleasure. If we seek these things, sin reigns in our lives. I really like the idea that if we put the two thoughts together, self-discipline versus living a sensual life uh, that our two comments gave us, we really get a pretty uh, full idea of what we pursue and what we turn away from. So guys, I really appreciate your answers on that. And we'll continue on here through the last part of this. And Mike, I'm going to ask you to do our reading for us. I'm going to ask you to read Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 21. So Mike, uh, and uh, I'm going to guess we're reading out of the King James Version. We are, because I've still got my new King James Bible down at Orleans. and. That is perfectly Wait, fine. Friday, I can get I can get out of this house hopefully by Friday. Yeah, and, that that's perfectly uh, fine. I did preach last Sunday, plan on going to Bible study tonight, but other than that, I've been confined and I'm getting tired of it. Yeah, just uh, just our audience knows Mike's uh, also uh, got a uh, had his knee, knee replaced. I I wanted to find a picture that I saw recently of Mike and he's sitting in his chair and there's a calf uh, yeah. visiting him. Yeah, and uh, I really wanted to share that picture with our audience because it's quite the picture of <laughs> there's my that was there's a, a four calf. day old calf only weighed sixty five pounds and yeah. uh, my grand that's my granddaughter's four H project and she wanted to bring it in and show it to Papa. Yeah, it's it's a it was a good picture. So Mike, go uh, ahead. Hey Brian, oh, real yeah. quick uh, before we start, uh, are we saying here that Mike is a partially new man? Oh, there you go. That's right. Yeah, he's <laughs> partially new man. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> One piece. Go ahead, time. Mike. Well, as one brother said, this knee's under warranty, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll see for how long. Okay, from verse uh, from Romans six, verse fifteen down through verse twenty-one. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Whereas ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and iniquity to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Thank you very much. So um, we'll go ahead and throw our chat room question out there. It's a little easy, so um, uh, but if you have different, uh, some other thoughts to add to it, we'd, we'd be grateful for that as well. The question is, what is the doctrine, and it, it should say, which we obeyed for salvation? Uh, what is the doctrine which we obeyed, obeyed for salvation that he references as we read through here, uh, talking about what we did uh, to be saved, verse 16? So uh, tell us, uh, give us the answer to that one. As I said, I don't think it's too complicated, but maybe you uh, want to add a little more to it. We'd be grateful to hear that. And I think I'm going to jump over to Mike, uh, who just finished our reading for us. Um, Mike, I have a question here. Uh, we're a little further on in Romans. We're going to be told that we have liberty in Christ. Yes. Uh, does it make sense to say we have liberty in Christ and then we just read that we are slaves of Christ? What do you think about that? makes perfect sense when you keep those two things in their proper context. Here, you have to understand that we were enslaved, if you will, to sin. Verse 16 helps us with that quite a bit. Know you not that his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Once we were slaves of sin, after baptism, we belong to Christ being purchased by his blood. 
the interesting thing is by belonging to Christ, he obviously owns us, we're purchased by his blood. That also enslaves us to Christ. But with Christ, our liberty, as we will read later, our liberty is we are free to live and move and have our continued being here on the earth as long as our minds tell us what to do by way of Christ. I made the statement one time in a gospel meeting that kind of got me in trouble because I wasn't clear about how I stated it. But it's my conviction that no Christian really has the right to think for himself. At Philippians 2 and verse 5, Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. While we certainly have choice, as a Christian, we should ask first, what would my Lord say? What would my Lord do? Where would my Lord go? And how would he perform these actions? And by searching the scriptures, act accordingly. Our life is no longer our own. It belongs to Christ, and therefore we are slaves to our master. Jesus. That's that's fantastic, Mike. Thank you very much for uh, kind of giving us some uh, some direction on that. Uh, I'm going to jump over to actually I'm going to jump over to John here. John, I really always find this terminology about being a slave to sin interesting. You know, he talks about being a slave to sin and being a slave of unrighteousness. But John, what would you say? How would you say Satan fits into that picture? Uh, are, are we also slaves to Satan? What do you think uh, goes on? Here? We are only a slave to the one we choose to serve, effectively. Um, and so, and, and you, remind me again what verse we're looking at. So well, we were, we were talking about verse 20. He talks about yeah. being slaves of sin. Yeah. Um, and um, um, so, you yeah, know, I uh, think verse 17, which is two. Now, th this is going to sound a little bit odd, especially in light of what Peter says about the devil goes about like a roaring lion. Okay. But I really think when it comes down to the application, we are serving sin and not seeking to serve the devil. All right. I, I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who will do things, I mean, they'll do things that are clearly sinful and their mind isn't, oh, I'm serving the devil. Okay. The mind is they are going to do what they want to do. And so they literally become literally become a servant of sin because they've chosen not to follow Christ. And so maybe that's what he's talking about. It's not so much just being servants of the devil. We only are if we choose to follow, not follow Christ. Okay. But I think the more practical application is that we are servants of sin when we choose to walk after, after sin. Uh, James makes the point that every man um, sins when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, you know. And so I think that that may be what Paul's talking about here. You know, it's very interesting, John. One of the things I was thinking of as we study this is that there is no statement in the Bible that, that uses the term slave uh, as with Satan. Uh, yeah. I mean, it speaks of some being ministers of Satan and serving Satan in the sense, but the idea of our slavery is typically spoken of with our sin. And yeah. I think that 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 idea oftentimes is that uh, we need to appreciate, as James would say in James chapter one, sin comes about with our desires, yeah. you know, and our our uh, disobedience. And so it really, uh, I think that there's the significance that, of what you're saying. Yeah. There. Other than getting in a lot more trouble, I'll say this too. We are the devil when it comes to our own lives, in a manner of speaking. Well, it's kind of interesting when uh, Jesus told Peter, you know, get behind me, Satan, yeah. you know, um, you know, that the, the language of, of, a, of a statement like that is, is, is he's, you know, what is the implication there? And of course, the yeah. word Satan means adversary or opponent, you know, or accuser. Those are all different yep. terms that the word devil means too. And so we, yeah. we would understand that, you know, there are things about that, that, that would be true. Yeah. I'm not saying um, there's not a devil. I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> I right. No, right. Right. I get, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Um, let's go ahead. I'm going to read the last two verses here, and then I want to take our conversation a little different direction. I uh, want to talk a little bit more about wages of sin uh, and consequences of sin. So let me read these last two verses here, um, and uh, we'll give a little more time to our chat question and come back at the end for that. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
uh, I, there's something, some real important things there in uh, Romans chapter six, verse 23, a very important declarative statement that's made. And I want to talk about that for just a few moments. Let me begin by asking Paul, Paul, what are the wages of sin? I oh, think so Paul had to step away. I'm Paul. sorry. Let me uh, jump over. Uh, I just uh, and I also just knocked my notes loose. Um, Brian, I forgot to turn my camera back on. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. So, Paul, the question was, what are the wages of sin? He references here. Well, he contrasts two things. The wages of sin uh, are death. The wages are death, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life. So, <clears throat> I think Tom made reference earlier to that spiritual death, the separation. Uh, from God that takes place when we sin. And so there is that separation, that death that occurs between us and God. And the wages of sin, what sin pays, is death. So, you know, the idea here, uh, you know, and we might, we're, we're going to try to make a couple of specific points about all this, is that uh, the death that we refer to, we know there's two deaths. Revelation 20 speaks of a second death uh, uh, that we want to consider here versus the first death. Let's try to understand something. Tom, you said something earlier that's uh, kind of important to us. You talked about the idea of death, physical death being something that had come down through Adam, uh, um, spiritual death being something that we received because of our sin. Um, let's use a word here, and I want you to kind of explain what we're talking about when we say, well, how would this be a distinction between the wages of sin, which is spiritual death, and the consequence of sin, as you talked about with Adam and physical death? What's the difference between the wages of sin? And the consequences of sin. Uh, well, believe it or not, it wasn't it wasn't too long ago, at least to the best of my knowledge, where it kind of dawned on me on this text the idea of a wage. A wage is something that you earn. Uh, 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 a wage, you know, when you think about a wage at a job, you get paid for what you've done, and you're entitled to it. And, and quite honestly, your employer cannot take that away from you legally. Or, or, or ethically or any, or, or any other way, it's yours. Uh, a consequence may not be your fault. And so I think that's the difference between a wage and a consequence. When you talk about a wage, you earn it. And, and, and it's kind of interesting to note that that language as it is used in this verse here, the wages of sin is death. That, uh, that tells me that if you die spiritually, it's nobody's fault but your own. You earned it. Did uh, did we earn Adam's death? No, and 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 that's kind of the point. It, it, it's a consequence, you know. I, I mean, it, it's 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 like a, a somebody that gets hit and wounded by a drunk driver it wasn't their fault. It's a consequence of the actions of the drunk driver. It's not even a consequence of their own action. You know, uh, you know, in, in that particular situation, and, and that's the whole thing about consequences. Sometimes consequences are a result of what we bring on ourselves. Other times they're just a result of something that somebody else did. That's different from a, a, a wage, which, which is something that you've earned. And, and I guess you can look at that if you bring it on yourself. Uh, uh, if there are consequences associated with something that you bring on yourself, I guess you could call that a wage. So it might be one of those things uh, uh, to clarify it that way. Uh, but it is important that we make the distinction. So, so this is something super important, Tom, because yeah. some people have taught in the past that because Adam's death is something all men inherit and the wages of sin is death, that by merging those two ideas, they have said that all men have inherited the wages of Adam's sin. And Tom, you have very uh, uh, clearly made a statement here to say that that's not the case, that it's a consequence of that. Uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you kind of a tricky question, and it's okay to throw it back at me if you want. In Genesis 3, uh, w is this a statement that's even true of Adam? In other words, did God make a distinction between the wage of sin and the consequence of sin? Spiritually that day, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, I... I, I do believe he was, uh, and, and I, I would say he did because he was separated from God as a result. As a result of the sin, something had to be taken care of. But when I say they, they make the debate whether or not he totally died spiritually, is it possible that Adam repented? And we just don't know about it. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and 
Um, it, I, it's possible. I mean, I just don't, we, we, we just don't know. We're not told anything about Adam after he left the garden other than he died and he had another son. Uh, good, good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. I'm going to jump over to Mike. Mike, I want to ask you uh, uh, kind of hey, to build on something Brian, Tom said. Brian, oh, well, I'm, sorry, I'm John, so ahead. sorry for your interruption. My program shut down. Oh. <laughs> um, and it, it killed... Now, the YouTube stream may be back up, but the Facebook it stream is. can't be brought it back is. up because it's a, a different um, alternate instance of it. So, are we live anywhere? It we are live back on... Up. We're back live on YouTube, and I am continuing the recording, so I might be able to merge the two together, assuming the previous recording was saved properly. Okay. Um, okay. But I just... If you want to pause to explain to people... You know, and maybe I'll, I'll let me drop a comment on Facebook real quick. Okay, so if if you are here and we have cut back and forth, we apologize for the technical difficulty. Uh, in our conversation here, we've been trying to make a distinction based on Romans six and twenty three. Uh, the conversation has been about death up till now, the dominion of death over Christ, uh, the way that death impacts us, and we're trying to make a distinction from that, from what he says in Romans six and verse twenty three, that the wages of sin are death. We've made the observation that the Bible is clear there are two deaths. Uh, Revelation 20 speaks about a first death and a second death, also a first resurrection, second resurrection. And so we've been trying to make a distinction between the wages of sin, which are the second death, the separation from God, and the consequences of sin, which all men inherited from Adam, including Christ, uh, who died physically and, and yet had not sinned. Mike, uh, I want to ask you a quick question. I want to ask you, uh, can we avoid the wages of sin? And then I want to ask you, can we avoid the consequences of sin? We can avoid the wages of sin if we live righteously unto death. The Lord himself promised, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Peter talks about adding to our faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, kindness, brotherly love. Let these things abound in us that we may that crown of life, Second Peter 1, 1 through 12. Um, they, we, we can't avoid the wages of sin being eternal death. We cannot avoid the consequences, and I was thinking about this when Tom was talking. I like to think of this as when we've made serious mistakes, we end up getting a scar of some kind. You mentioned my knee a minute ago. Well, I'll use that as that's been from a mistake of abuse, from finishing concrete, stand, uh, being on my knees so much, uh, working under cars and bending and such. That's a consequence of that. And now I've got a scar that will forever remind me, don't be dumb enough to do that again. Well, sin's a lot like that. It leaves a mental scar, at least in the human, that says, look, you went down that path once. You don't need to do that again. That's a consequence. That tells me this is the result of wrongdoing. This is the result of righteous doing. And by looking at those examples, I follow the path of righteousness, which allows then at the end of my life, death in the flesh, but the gift of God being eternal life. You know, it's important to understand, Mike, uh, and what you, you use a couple of really good examples too is that, as you said, the consequences of sin might be something we cannot avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, that The importance of that is to understand that sometimes people believe that baptism washes away even the consequences of sin. No, and, it does uh, not. And that's that's important to understand. You know, we just we just recently had a sermon on marriage and divorce and remarriage, and that's a good example of, of a misunderstanding. The murderer can't replace believe. the life that he took. You, yeah. You can't replace the lie that you told. Yeah. Can't, yeah. a thief that spends the money can't return it. There's yeah, all that there. those kind of consequences. But forgiveness can still be there. Divorce right. and marriage is probably one of the most prominent problems among brethren today. You can be forgiven of that immorality in that marriage. But that does not permit you to say, okay, that whole thing's been washed away, going, I can go on and do whatever I want to do in my life now. That's back to the liberty we talked about versus enslavement to Christ. We're at liberty being free from sin, but we're slaves to him to obey with uh, obey, understanding the consequences of what we did to put us in a physically wrong situation. Yeah, 
So, so it's important. And Mike, what's really good about what you said is that it, it, it is a difficult thing that some people can't quite understand that yeah. the consequences of sin may be still there even after we have had the wages of sins washed off at baptism. Absolutely so. Absolutely. So, so that's why it's important. Uh, Paul, uh, kind of a generic question, and uh, I'm almost tempted to pass over it, but can you think of some any other examples in the Bible or in life of difference, uh, the way we look at wage and sin? I, I, I kind of think we've covered most of them, but it, I was going to give it to you anyway if you had another thought. Yeah, I had sent you a note. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and I missed right. it. Uh, uh, because I thought that Tom yeah, and uh, Mike both gave really good examples of that, both of yeah. physical death, spiritual death, and also uh, divorce, remarriage, uh, murder. Uh, there, there's lots right. of situations you know, there. I, the only other one I was thinking of, you know, when David and Bathsheba had sinned, uh, you know, that, that God <clears throat> God said to David that you, you are forgiven, but the consequences would be your family's going to be in strife, your child is going to die. Uh, you know, and there's a good example to say, well, that doesn't sound like forgiven. Well, he was forgiven of the wages of sin, but there were still going to be consequences to what. Yeah, happened. I think uh, Nathan tells him, uh, you shall not die. Right. Not not that he would never physically die, but God wasn't going to strike him down in that. Exactly sense. right. Yeah. But there or, were, even, or even the second death. I mean, it. Uh, uh, yes. although I'm not sure it could even be uh, symbolically, at least related to that idea, you know, but yes. that he wasn't cut off from God. Um. Uh, Tom, here's a question. Uh, you know, Paul got a, a one that wasn't fair, but uh, I'm going to throw it back to Tom because maybe you put a, some thought into this. How about righteousness? Are there wages of righteousness? Are there consequences of righteousness? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, uh, I, I want more of an answer. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, absolutely. Uh, and and that's another interesting question when you define what righteousness is and you relate it to the grace of god because in reality uh as we've already noted in chapter three there are none who are genuinely righteous uh, even though we may be righteous now you know we've hungered and thirst after righteousness and because of the grace of god we have been made righteous but it has something to do with our conduct and yes there are consequences and wages associated with that uh, uh sometimes good things happen because we are doing the right thing. I've, I, I, I've, al I've always uh, taught, you know, from a biblical standpoint, how much better would society be if everybody followed the standard that we find in the Bible? And, uh, but people don't. And, and, and when you look at the ugliness that is around us, and I think we're in the midst of a of a very, very ugly time, you know, I'm looking uh, uh, from my limited life experiences and so on. Uh, and, and I just see the fruits of ungodliness everywhere there. It, it, but when people are righteous, what good happens when that happens uh, or when that takes place? And then there's the spiritual aspect of it. If you want to go to heaven, the, the consequence and the wage of righteousness is being righteous in God's eyes and, and, and the, uh, the wages, eternal life. Very good. Uh, you know, and like I said, we would understand that it's a wage that we've not earned. It's a wage that's been credited to us because of, uh, because of faith, but it is something that fits the category of wages because we received that at the end, mm -hmm. as we've talked about the idea of wages. Um, you know, I was thinking of different consequences of righteousness. I was thinking like maybe the fruit of the spirit might fit into that. The, uh, you know, the, the characteristics of the, the benefits of righteousness. And I think you said all of those very well. Uh, any other comments we want to make before we go back to the chat? If not, I know we've got an answer to our question in our YouTube chat. Our question was, what is the doctrine uh, which was obeyed, verse 17 speaks about, that we obeyed for our salvation? Gregor Hinckley gave us an answer to that question. He says it was a baptism through Christ. Um, and of course, he's pointing right back to the beginning of that same chapter. The good news being Christ's redemption of our souls through his death and the promise of our salvation by his resurrection. Because of faith, we are baptized as directed. So, you know, we can we, we could add to that. We could say, you know, hearing and believing. He's going to talk about that in Romans chapter 10. Uh, uh, hearing, believing, confessing. Those are all the things that he'll he'll kind of point into. He's talked here about repentance and baptism being a part of that as well. And the whole point is, these are the things we obeyed that brought us 
uh, that brought us into our relationship with Christ. And so that's the answer we were looking for. We appreciate that, Gregor. Are there any other comments or questions or thoughts as we finish up? Uh, and uh, if not, I, I'll let you make them. And if not, I'll turn it over to John. I think I think you've done a good job, Brian. Um, very good job with, with the study today. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to apologize. Uh, probably about 15, 10 minutes ago, the, the vMix program that I have running that makes all the streaming possible decided to say, let's restart without any notice. And it restarted, which meant the Facebook stream and YouTube stream went down. And when the Facebook stream goes down, it cannot be restarted right away. It's a different instance. The YouTube was able to restart. And so we apologize for that. Um, I'll try to, to take the recordings of both programs and make it one, you know, make it to one. So you can go back and watch the end of it if you've missed any of the section here. But if you're still watching us, it means that you are with us. And so I want to thank you for taking your time for studying with us today as we looked at Romans chapter 6. Gentlemen, real quick, any of the final thoughts or comments? Paul, let's throw it to you. No, I'm glad to be back. Uh, glad to be with you guys. And I really enjoyed the study today. Brian did an outstanding job. Okay, Mike? I'm good. I, I am so thankful for the study and uh, look forward to being with you again next week, Lord willing. Sounds good. Mr. Tom. No, uh, um, appreciate the study. It's an important, important passage talking about uh, we determine the outcome of our lives. Who, who are you going to serve? That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If everything goes according to plans or as we try to say, and we do mean, Lord willing, we'll continue our study with Romans chapter 7. That'll be next Wednesday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. In the Eastern Time Zone, that'll be at noon. 9 a.m. Pacific Time. And 10 a.m. Mountain Time. That's right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.